If you're just sitting there, what do we call your energy exchange? Yep. Now, are we going to vote them off the island? Or is she right? Or is her group right? Show of hands. Who thinks this is right? Anybody have a show of hands who think no? Good. Good. While you're sitting there, you're always expending energy. If you stop expending energy, you will die. I'm sorry. The brain always has to expend energy. The heart has to beat. The lungs have to be able to inflate and deflate. So there's always going to be some kind of minimal level of energy expenditure. When you are awake, okay, or even sometimes if you're just sort of regular sleeping, we're going to call that resting metabolic rate. Resting metabolic rate. That's good. If I made you guys as a secondary question pick one thing, the one thing that plays the single largest role in what every one of your resting metabolic rates is, what is it? Yes, it's muscle mass. Okay, it's muscle mass. Muscle is a very metabolically active tissue. The more muscle you have, the higher your resting metabolic rate. Higher your resting metabolic rate, the more Doritos you get to eat without having to buy bigger pants. Okay? We'll, we'll look at a little bit of that next week. Okay? Or the week after. That's resting metabolic rate. Okay. Good. There are other things that play a role in metabolic rate. We turn the air conditioner off in here and it gets hot, your metabolic rate goes up. If you just exercise, and then you sit down, but like an hour later, your metabolic rate's probably still going to be elevated. Okay? So things like that. You eat a meal, or the time you're doing digestion, your metabolic rate goes up. Okay? There's lots of things that contribute to this. That's kind of the general idea. Now, my second question, I put you guys in a coma. We do the same thing. Who thinks they know what that's for? Okay, Danny, let's go. And he said it's basal metabolic rate. You guys agree? Does your own group agree? Yeah. Okay. Probably did y'all's group get that? Basil. Okay. Guys, call them what y'all put. Basil. Anybody not put basil? Okay. So what's the difference here? This is a very kind of small semantical difference, but it's important. What's the difference between resting rate and basal rate? No, they want to venture a guess. Isn't basal like just the necessary one to survive while resting? Good. Then. Basal is the bare, bare, bare minimum to keep you alive. Okay, that's why you're in a coma. All we're doing is like this is the absolute bottom necessary amount of energy expenditure to run your physiological systems to keep you alive, okay? That's basal. Resting is here, I'm awake, or I'm taking a nap, or something like, there's other things that are happening that's not just the bare, bare minimum, okay? So just keep these two things in mind. Okay, if I wanted to measure either one of those in you guys, what would I need to measure? That's our next question. What two things could I measure? Who thinks you know one of them? Go ahead, Mike. Y'all got this. <clears throat> Just one. 
We'll see which one she puts. Okay, you're good. That's one. Who thinks they know the other one? Y'all screwed. Y'all get a second answer beyond that? Or, I'm sorry, Hannah has the, the thing. I don't know why I thought Carly was right. Question three. So I've got both of them right. Okay. So here's the question. We measure heat. Why would we measure heat? How do we do that? What are we getting heat from metabolism? It's a byproduct. A byproduct of what? Okay, breaking molecules down, right? We lose a tremendous amount of heat when we break stuff down, right? What do you do when you get cold? You shiver, right? When you shiver, you're getting involuntary muscle contractions. Why do you shiver when you're cold? You increase metabolic rate, and you release heat. It will hopefully warm you up, okay? How do I measure heat? And I take a thermometer and just like slap a thermometer on Avery's forehead. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. That is a way to do it. There were also skin probes. So. Gotta take ourselves not too seriously in life. Okay. Okay. Well, could I do that? Like if you start exercising and then I, te I check and see if your body temperature has increased, is that a measure of heat? Sort of, right? What else? You made Avery get up and do a bunch of jumping jacks and I said, Kyle, put your hand near her, but don't touch her. Could you feel the heat coming off you think? Probably. You're losing heat, as we'll see the last week, through a process called conduction and convection, as well as evaporation. What you can feel really is conduction and convection, okay? So if I want to measure heat production in you guys, this is the single most accurate way to measure metabolism. It's also completely stinky. You'll never be able to do it, okay? You gotta have a separate room or rooms. You gotta circulate water around the outside of them. You gotta stick you in there, say, do something, your body gives off heat. It raises the temperature of the water circling around the room by a certain amount, and we can then estimate how much that goes up, how much heat you're producing. If we know how much heat you're producing, then we can back calculate what your metabolic rate was. Okay? It's fine, but I got to stick you in a room. I think I tell the health and fitness class, they have a mock-up of the International Space Station that can do that. It's somewhere in Europe. I think it's in Switzerland. And they'll stick some of the European astronauts that are going to go up there in there for, you know, like six months at a time to make sure they don't just go crazy when they send you to space. Because, like, once you're up there, you're just kind of there, right? Like, we can't just come get you tomorrow if you have a freak out. So, um, well, I'm not an astronaut. Um, in a lot of ways. Okay, the second way is O2 production. This is going to highlight a separate thing. Do I make heat in anaerobic metabolism? Do I use oxygen in anaerobic metabolism? No. But do I make heat when I do anaerobic metabolism? I'm not sure that we do. I mean, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> Just ask. Okay. The, the caveat when we measure metabolic rates in these things, for the most part, all we're ever measuring is the rate of aerobic energy supply, aerobic energy production. Okay. So when I measure oxygen, what I'm actually measuring is sort of not production. I'm measuring oxygen use. Where? 
We're integrating things back into yesterday's material, right? Where in the aerobic metabolic pathway am I using the oxygen? Uh-oh. What is its job at the end of the electron transport chain that I promised y'all would be on the test? That's right. Final electron test. Okay. So how would we measure this in you guys? We go down to my lab right now. We can do this. What are we going to do? Callie's sort of seen it. Shush. Okay. What am I collecting? What is the metabolic cart collecting or looking at? Okay. Okay. That's very good. We collect the air that you breathe in and the air that you breathe out. We know how much oxygen and CO2 is in the air right now. Okay. If I have you exercise or if I just have you sit there and I collect the air that you expire. I can compare how much CO2 is in expired air versus regular air, how much oxygen is in expired air versus regular air. And so the changes in those two things should tell us, right, when I use oxygen, I make CO2 and then I use oxygen at the end. So I can look at how much CO2 is being made, but also how much oxygen is getting brought down in the expired air. And I can use that to get a rough approximation of what's being used in aerobic recovery. Okay. We'll also talk about in a few minutes a concept called respiratory exchange ratio. I look at the balance of O2 that is used, the so metabolic rate, versus CO2 that is produced. And I can tell you, are you metabolizing carbohydrates or fat or some mixture? Because we need more oxygen or we make more CO2 or less CO2 to metabolize each of those substrates through the Krebs cycle. It has to go through more time to do it. So we can know some things about all. So that's good. All right. Talk about what VO2 max is in, in a few minutes. What was the next question that I asked? What was, oh, I know, okay. We had Riley do some jumping jacks. What happens to her metabolic rate? Colin, what did your group put? Your metabolic rate. You drew the epoch. What happened on the front end? As she does slow jumping jacks, medium jumping jacks, fast jumping jacks, it increased. Okay. As exercise intensity increased. Nope, let me say that again. Go back. I think all of you are aware of the concept of exercise. Is that right? Learned about that in health and fitness. If you had anything else, exercise intensity. Exercise intensity is a way for us to describe the metabolic rate during a bout of exercise. So you've got resting rate while you're sitting, light intensity activity like walking, metabolic rate goes up a little bit. There's a range of those rates where it goes up. You start jogging, it's moderate, it goes up even more, okay? High intensity exercise is like fast jogging or sprinting or something. That's how we characterize intensity. It's actually a measure of metabolic rate. So it's a rate of oxygen use, okay? Or a rate of CO2 production. That's how we do those things. So as Riley started doing her jumping jacks, metabolic rate is gonna go up in relation to what her work rate is. Slow jumping jacks kind of goes up, and then it might level off, right? And then we have her go up again, and it goes up again, and it might level off, and it goes up, and it goes up. Stepwise level. Okay. Good. Someone come and draw what you think happens when you stop exercising. I'll start. For you guys. Okay.
So this is roughly what we were doing to the oxygen consumption if we were to measure to the metabolic rate while well, Riley was doing your jumping jacks. When she stopped right here, what happens next? Okay. Yep. Do you guys agree? And this sort of nodding yes, but frowning. Really, what do you think? Of the right? You agree, okay? Oh, y'all said you drew the whole thing. Is that kind of what y'all drew? That's the exercise ending that looks the same for the foods. Okay, it's okay. All right. What do we call this? Exercise ends here. This is something called EPOC. Okay. When you stop exercising, the energy demand from your muscles goes from wherever it was, which was up there by three, all the way back down to rest. Okay. The demand, the muscles do not need ATP anymore. They don't need that level of ATP anymore. But your metabolic rate takes a little bit of time to work its way back down towards rest. My guess is Riley's still above rest, okay? If we'd had her run for half an hour, she'd still be above rest two days from now, okay? And that's the point of Orange Theory. <laughs> I'm serious, that's their afterburn or whatever. It's just deep on. There's at least real science behind it, okay? What happens is your metabolic rate does not immediately go back down to baseline when you stop exercising. That's why your heart rate stays elevated for a little while. Your breathing stays up for a little while. But what's happening during all of this? Why does this happen? Work rate goes down, so why do we need to keep metabolic rate up? It's a great test question. Why do we need to keep metabolic rate up? Emily, you have any ideas? Okay. Catherine, can you help her? You want to try to help her? Why does your metabolic rate have to stay elevated? Okay. It costs you more energy to breathe, for sure. Yeah. What else is going on? Okay. Okay. So, we are a this takes that and work to get it. So, it creates an oxygen test. And then by the time the aerobic system begins, um, they use their work by energy. And then at the end of it, those PCR and glycolysis, their stores are located. Okay. They need to be stored and return back to baseline. So that's where that slope is. It's like working to restore those. So ninety percent correct. It's very, very good. We're a little off on what we call it for stuff on the front, but that's okay. But she's basically right. Why do you do this? Here you're recovering. This is real work, like physio physiological recovery. Okay, you're replenishing creatine phosphate. You're taking if you made any AMP through the myokinase reaction, you're returning that back to ATP. Right. There's still elevated energy use by the heart and by the lungs. So that's going to be there. But to clear out lactate, we have to return pH to normal. The size of EPOC, and I'll show you guys some slides on this. The size of EPOC generally tells us two things. One, 
How hard were you working? Exercise that is longer and a higher intensity has a bigger epoch. And then two, this one may seem counterintuitive to you guys. Epoch can also be used as a measure of how well your aerobic metabolism works. People that are more highly trained aerobically, more mitochondria, you for any given amount of work done will have a smaller epoch or a shorter epoch. Smaller maybe gets us in trouble. We'll have a, the area of the curve, maybe the same, but it's shorter. You have a shorter epoch than a person that is less well trained. The epoch is only aerobic metabolism. Using aerobic metabolism to essentially restore our anaerobic metabolic pathways, to restore pH, to bring temperature down, and all of these things. Okay. Okay. Watch today. All right. Did I ask another question or was that one in? Why is my wife sending me pictures of the stage? You can't have their pictures. Like, why, why are you doing this to me? Anyway, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to need a moment. We're going to regroup. It's going to be fine. You asked about Riley. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Last one. Riley, how your, how your delts feel? We're good? Okay. She holds the bag out here. What do we call it when she set the bag down? What is that? Quitting. Okay. <laughs> Fine. Yes. Maybe. Maybe she quit. Maybe she didn't. She can no longer hold the bag up. So from a physiological perspective, what is that definition of? That's fatigue. Okay, that's fatigue. All these slides and all of this, right? I have in the past, we teach a PhD level class just about fatigue. Fatigue is a failure to produce the desired or expected force, right? She can hold the bag. She's able to generate that force, but then she got to a place where I can't do it anymore. Or maybe she could have, she just chose not to. Either way, that's fatigue. That's task failure, okay? Ask failure. Why did she fatigue? It's the age old question, right? This is part of what A.B. Hill's Nobel Prize was about. What's the, what's the energy expenditure? How's it related to fatigue and those things? We're still working on some of this stuff. Okay. What's going to blow y'all's mind is I said, if we had Riley up here and then we had, I don't know who else, we had Zach from her group up here, Riley's going to beat him. Ladies, y'all are more resistant to fatigue on average than men. Okay. It's beyond the scope of our class to explain why. But interestingly enough, we've done some stuff in my lab and in others. If we exclude blood flow to your muscles, it all you all it's the same. The sex difference goes away. So some weird things have happened. Kind of interesting. So why did she put the bag down? She was fatigued, but why was she fatigued? This is the important thing about fatigue. Where did it come from? Okay. Why do you need to understand cognition to contraction? Why do you need to understand the role of firing rate and motor unit recruitment and sensory motor integration? It's because of fatigue as much as it is about like how much weight can you lose. So where in all of those pathways did things go wrong that made Riley put the bag down? Claire, what y'all put? Okay. Why did you put excitation contraction coupling stops? Give me the smart ass answer. <laughs> Because I said that the other day. That's right. Okay. What happens if excitation contraction coupling fails? I cannot release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Why would that lead to I cannot hold the bag in front of me anymore? I don't have any more cross bridges. Okay. Good. You don't think that's what happened? Riley, could you tell? Was your excitation contraction coupling failing? 
Not yet, it was still okay? It's probably debatable. If you were in the lab, we could tell, but okay. So what failed? It, it wasn't excitation contraction. Company. What else could fail? My head, the brain. Why would my brain fail? So she stopped. Okay. Is that a special kind of fatigue? Yeah. What do we call that? Central fatigue, right? It's basically you just something happened upstream of the motor neuron, brain, spinal cord. The easiest way to think of central fatigue is I stop, I quit. Okay. Quitting sometimes carries a poor connotation, but in the thing of exercise, think about the last time you exercised. Could you have done more? I'm chasing you like with a cattle prod or something. Could you have done one more rep? Could you have run a little bit faster? Right? Could you have given us just a little bit more? If the answer is yes, then you stop because of central fatigue. Right? Did you stop because your legs hurt? Very common. Central fatigue. Okay. There's some other things we'll get into a few more as well. If it's excitation contraction coupling failure, what kind of fatigue is that? Peripheral fatigue. Can you guys think of another kind of peripheral fatigue? Where else could something get messed up? Huh? Sure, that would probably be, we would call that excitation contraction coupling because that gets messed up, and so then we can't get calcium out, okay? The real answer is anywhere in that pathway. Anything downstream of the motor neuron, any signal, anywhere. No acetylcholine across the junction. No action potentials down the motor axis, right? No ATP to break actin and myosin apart. So calcium to bind to troponin. Any of those places, right? Any of those places could conceivably result in peripheral fatigue. Okay. All right. Let's take a break for a few minutes. Then I'll actually pull up the slides and we'll kind of walk our way relatively quickly through and kind of hit the high points of these things. Okay. What do you mean? What happened? You're about to tell. Oh, like people went like 12 minutes. I remember. And they were cheating, like really, like, you know. Trying to shrug instead of hold them out. Um, but we that's a that's what we call that strong level of motivation to overcome the central fatigue. And so those people put it down because of peripheral fatigue. And we'll get to this in a few minutes, but I, what I will tell you guys is that in most human activity, you are going to get central and peripheral fatigue simultaneously. You're going to get some peripheral fatigue. And in a lot of instances, some of the things that happen with the peripheral then cause central fatigue. And then you stop, right? Probably because of central. But it's good. Yes, sir. Okay. But like when you're like your legs can do more like your grip. Yeah, that's well, a great question. And so one of the things that happens, right? And this is an interesting thing if you try to do like powerlifting. You're only as strong as your weakest sort of joint or joint movement or your weakest muscle group. And so I'm failing because I can't hold the bar. 
And a lot of that probably is peripheral fatigue from a grip standpoint because you squeeze. This is one of the reasons that we think generally that women are more resistant to fatigue than men is you're squeezing. So in your forearms, you generate enough force, that force gets turned into intramuscular pressure inside here. So it raises the pressure. And that pressure rises so much that it's higher than systolic blood pressure. And you stop being able to send arterial blood to the muscle. And so it's a lack of oxygen. And at that point, then it's peripheral fatigue because there's there's no oxygen, I can't make enough ATP, and I fake, no matter how hard you're trying to go. And that's a problem of small muscle mass exercise in a lot of it. High for small muscle mass exercise. That would be my guess. Is it's, that is probably peripheral rather than. Really going to freak y'all out when I tell you that if you try to go and move, part of the reason you don't run as fast when you haven't eaten breakfast if you exercise in the morning is central fatigue. Low blood glucose levels, the brain doesn't like it and it says, we're not going to let you go very fast because we're afraid we're going to use up all of our glucose and then we might go into a coma and die. And so, like, you're like, I'm trying to go, and I just can't go because the brain, the color motor cortex, let's, let's shut that down. Happens during marathons. You might ever run a marathon? Rocky's run a marathon? You start feeling really bad at about mile 20, 23, all your muscle glycogen is gone. All you got left is blood glucose. The brain is not like that. It's very, very, very worried that you might get into a place you could be hypoglycemic and go into a coma. And so it's like you got to be really, really motivated to keep pushing through all that. So it just makes you feel bad, right? Told you guys a typical person has 1,500 calories of stored, stored glycogen. Bought you about 100 calories to run a move. Whether it's fast or slow, it's still 100 calories. It varies based upon your weight. So 15, 18, if you're good at this, you eat a bunch of carbs, you can load up. You might get 18 or 200,000 calories, or two, 18 or 2,000 calories. It's going to be there. So it's very common. That's why you drink it. That's when the Gatorade works. That's when the little sugar do pack works because it raises blood glucose. But you got to start taking those at like mile 12, right? Like an hour before you're going to get to the other place and your blood glucose stays up when the glycogen. So we'll talk about a lot of that tomorrow. You had another question, Mark. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's not like what I asked yesterday about the central, uh, like, Yes. Really? Yes. Yeah. Practice. So is that more on like the side than the actual parasympathetic? Or is it different between have more than that? Or not? Which one of these is more like neural kind of thing? Yeah. We get into trouble if we start saying is a sympathetic or parasympathetic a neural signal or not. Is it neural? Is it physiological? It's sometimes a bit of both. It depends upon where we are. Um, it's, it's a neurotransmitter and it's a hormone. So let me think about this. So the probably the, the, the least hedging answer is in some instances, especially as you become more used to things and more trained, you get a reduced sympathetic nervous system response at any given work rate. Right? That's going to happen. But then you can also train, we call it persistence based, your willingness and ability to tolerate high work rates, unpleasant feelings, high, high core body temperatures, becoming familiar with what all of that feels like generally is going to enhance your ability to withstand that to a greater extent in the future. Some people have different personality traits. There's a personality trait that we measure in all of our pains and it's called catastrophizing. A catastrophizer is a person that, right, I am terrified something bad is going to happen. And so at the first sign of this happening, I just freak out, right? That's a catastrophizer. There are people that are pain catastrophizers. They feel pain and then they're like, oh God, this is the worst thing ever. I'm going to break something. Something bad is going to happen. Stop. It. And then there are other people that are less catastrophizers. They generally display more stoicism and other kind of personality traits that are going to be associated with persistence. 
and they experience the pain and they sort of they acknowledge it, but they don't freak out about it. And so they're able to kind of push through. And there's discomfort, there's high levels of you guys heard of a thing called um, perception of effort called RPE, right? It's probably a lot of people will do. They will try to use it during resistance exercise. It's not that great. It's really beneficial during aerobic exercise when you're running or you're biking, right? It's basically how hard are you having to try to do this? RPE is um, a psychobiological phenomenon where the brain integrates metabolic work, heart rate, blood pressure, cardiac output, breathing rate, right? O2 levels in the blood, CO2 levels in the blood, pain, all of this kind of stuff, but it also regulates how much input is the motor cortex giving, driving the muscle. And so when we make motor cortex fire more, you perceive that as being more difficult. It requires more effort to continue at that. And when people practice doing that, giving high efforts more often, they get better at continuing to give those high efforts. And so we can train some of it. Some people are just naturally better at it than others as well. And so, you know, what gets really fascinating is how much of this is training in like Navy SEAL training, right? If you, um, I'm about three quarters of the way through a book. It's called Do Hard Things. It's written by a guy um, who is a, actually a cross-country coach, but he has a master's degree in exercise physiology. And they talk about things like this, and about how much of this is mental versus physiological and all of these kind of things. And it's really interesting because like we talk about for all of us, like do a hard thing as I studied for a test, took a test, right? I did something that was difficult and I didn't just fold my stuff up and go home in that way. So, anyway. Oh, you have a question? Does it really have it? Yes. Uh, like did it all look like these injuries like the and stuff? What do you mean? Like, uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Well, because you ask, like, potential fatigue, could you do more? When, like, uh, I don't know, I had 12 on a party and the cops showed up and got one. <laughs> and I'm like, we ran, that's the fastest I think I've ever ran in my life. I don't think I can run any faster. So, okay. I mean, you, don't like you ran because you were scared, right? <laughs> It's like you do as much as like you think you can, but you ask the question, could you have done more? Yeah. <laughs> so the, the short answer to that is there is something to it, right? I mean, you can hear the stories, right? Of like, I picked this car up off of somebody that was getting drunk. Right? Those things happen. Those people, when they're done, like they the call you to them, like they just obliterate their muscle, but it happens, right? There are some of these kind of superhuman feats of strength or endurance and all of this kind of stuff that are driven by those things, right? I had the same experience as you, but it wasn't at a party. I was being chased by an owl. <laughs> I was out for a run down one of the main streets in Athens, Georgia, and I got attacked by a goddamn owl. <laughs> Twice. I've rarely been so terrified in my entire life. I assume it was the same owl because I had I was running and the thing came and hit me in the back of the head. I thought I, I thought a limb had fallen out of a tree and had hit me. It knocked me down. And I roll over and there's just an owl going right there. And I hauled ass away. Then I had to figure out like, well, my car is parked at the other end. How am I going to get back down the road? There are other people running. Like, this is a very frequent thing. There were other people running. I'm like, what? And then, so I thought, okay, I'm going to go on the other side of the street, going back. And I do it. It chases me again. My wife said she'd never seen me so scared in my life. because she, she ran on a different path that night and did things. So, I, yes, the epinephrine never helped. Sheer terror. I ran 400 meters faster than I ever did when I was running track i'll tell you that much so okay we're going to talk about that tomorrow when we talk about epinephrine and epinephrine and see the thing the system activation in the moment we group i am mortified of burning stuff 
mortified. We're going to the beach in a few weeks. And we'll be out there, and you know, the seagulls like freaking swoop down and try to get all your stuff. And I'm like doing this the whole time. Terrified of birds. Anyway, cut my head open. I had to get a freaking tetanus shot. And I was like, please tell me I don't have to have a rabies shot. And then we decided I didn't have to have rabies, but oh, okay. All right. So assessment of energy use, right? So do you guys understand what I did? Sorry, class. What did I do to start class? We did all the group things. What did I basically tell you all? <laughs> Not all slides, right, then. Did I just signal to you guys this is the really important stuff? Notice that. Pay attention. Take note of those things. Okay. Those were the things that I thought were important enough that I need to ask you guys about. Okay? So, background stuff. Direct calorimetry, that's measuring heat production. About 60% of energy we make gets lost as heat. <coughs> we are wildly inefficient. Okay? Because we make so much heat, you all will see in two weeks, that if you couldn't dissipate heat through evaporation, you'd cook yourself in about 45 minutes. You'd raise your core body temperature like eight or nine degrees Celsius in like 45 minutes. It's crazy. Okay. A calorimeter is how we would measure this. It's this insulated airtight chamber, right? We put you in there, you run, or you just live in the damn thing. Water circulates around the outside. You do stuff, heat goes out, it goes through the edges because it's like aluminum foil, basically. And it raises, it raises the temp in the water. There's a concept called specific heat. Water has a specific heat. It requires X amount of heat to raise one cubic centimeter of water, one degree Celsius. And based upon increments of that, we can calculate how much heat you're producing. I've seen one of these before. They had one at the Med Center in Little Rock, Arkansas at UAMS in their aging center. Um, we set up like a, like a one bedroom apartment. Um, they're outrageously expensive. They're very, very infeasible, but they're really accurate. Okay. What we do instead, and what if you all have, have or will take exercise test in the description or exercise physiology lab with Dr. Pereira, you guys will do something called indirect calorimetry. And this is basically we measure production of CO2 or use of oxygen from expired air. Okay. We can do that while you're just sitting here and get your resting metabolic rate. We can do it during exercise. If you want to be real fun, they make portable ones that fit in a fanny pack. We can put the mask on you and just go for a jog around campus. Okay. What we're looking at is that we are assuming O2 and CO2 exchanged in the lungs, from the air into the lungs and from the lungs into our blood, from our blood into our muscle, that we're not losing any of it anywhere. That's a mostly true kind of assumption. Okay, it's mostly true. That's why it's called indirect calorimetry. If I know how much oxygen you're using in the electron transport chain, I can estimate caloric expenditure. Okay. Now, I'm not wearing my watch. But most of you probably have some sort of smart watch that will, from the smart watch, it measures your heart rate. We'll talk about that next week when I'm not here. I'll lecture about that on the video, but as Energy expenditure goes up. Remember, the cardiovascular system functions as a support system for metabolism. So as O2 use, electron transport chain stuff goes up, so does heart rate in a very, very direct fashion. So if I know how much you weigh, and I guess at how much muscle you have, and I know what your body weight is, I know what your heart rate was during a bout of exercise, and even on top of that, I know how fast you were going because your watch has GPS in it, know how far, how fast, how much you weigh, and what your heart rate was, I can do a reasonable job of back calculating how much aerobic caloric expenditure you have. They all overestimate because it's in their interest to overestimate, right? But it does pretty good. So that's what we're going to get here. There's two terms I want you to know, VO2 and VCO2. The V stands for volume. And the O stands for oxygen and the CO2 stands for oxygen. 
VO2 is sometimes called oxygen use, oxygen uptake, oxygen consumption. Those are all used relatively interchangeably. It's the amount or volume of oxygen used by muscles and other tissue. Okay. The CO2 is the volume of expired carbon dioxide. We can see how much CO2 is in the gas that you're breathing off. And just from the CO2, we can get a pretty accurate estimate which you've done in the electron transport once you've gone through the cross Okay. So we're going to use those two things. So when I talk about max VO2, I mean the maximum amount of oxygen that your muscles can take in and use during high, high intensity exercise. Okay. And that's going to be our best estimate of how aerobically or aerobically metabolically fit. Nice picture from the 1980s, right? Metabolic heart, we're breathing. We know we got air coming in, we got air coming out. We're going to measure what all is going on in there. Things we have now are a little smaller, they look a little more high tech than all of that, but it's basically the same idea. Okay? People have been doing this since the Harvard fatigue lab in the 20s. Okay in the 20s. We can't directly measure heat production. We can't directly measure ATP turnover in you without opening your muscles up and a whole bunch of things. So let's measure oxygen use. Okay. We did these kinds of things. We'll save a little bit of the daily energy use for next week when we talk about obesity, body composition, and those things. If you read in books, it will say that an average college age person's resting metabolic rate is probably 1,800 to 3,000 calories, depending upon how much muscle mass you have. I think those are wild overestimates. Wild. Oh. Do you think in body scans are accurately resting in body scan? What's that in? Like an what's in, like. What's the in body scan? They have one in um, turkeys over there. Oh, the body yeah. scan. It does body composition uh -huh. based upon that. Yeah. yeah. So, if we know your body composition mm -hmm. and we can estimate muscle mass correctly, we can get a more reasonable estimate of resting metabolic rate. But these seem pretty high. These seem pretty high. And I think that's part of the problem that we run into is that everybody thinks that they can eat more than they actually can or than they actually need. And that's part of what has led to kind of our obesity epidemic is that we, we have these artificial things. Right, like you look on the back of any of your foods, and it's like based upon a 2,000 calorie diet. Well, who needs 2,000 calories? Not everybody. For some people, 2,000 calories, even if it's all salad, right, and carrots and all the things that are supposedly good for you, that's more than a daily expenditure. They're going to add weight. They're going to add weight as adipose tissue. That can eventually be dangerous. So we got to be careful about these things. So this is this gets us into a little bit of trouble, right? Some of you in class that are, we'll just say, more petite, won't even make that gender, but some of you all that are smaller individuals, you might only need 1,000 or 1,200 calories in a day, just if all you did was sit there. This is in absence of any kind of moving or exercising. You guys have to walk around a bunch. Many of you all probably actually burn more than 3,000 calories. That's not what I'm saying. This is if all you did was sit on the couch all day. Just keep that in mind. Okay. We talked about fat-free mass, fat mass, right? Muscle mass is often termed fat-free mass. Muscle mass is the thing that determines resting metabolic rate. Right? It's the thing. Everybody needs to resistance train so you can eat Doritos or whatever else it is that you like. Dunkin' Donuts, you can have that coffee with all the creamer in it, like whatever your vice is. Cheesecake. Mm. Okay. All right. So let's talk about energy expenditure during exercise. Now, I asked this question on, on the quiz. Okay. And I tried to draw this out on my little thing here when we were talking about what Riley was doing. When you start exercising, right, you need more force production. As we use more force, and we cycle our cross bridges, we need more ATP. We're going to get that ATP from the creatine phosphate pathway, glycolysis from 
oxidative phosphorylation in the air. We're going to get it from somewhere. Okay. What happens then is as aerobic metabolism begins to increase, if we measure oxygen uptake or oxygen consumption, it also increases. At relatively moderate, kind of light to moderate intensity exercise, we see a stepwise pattern like this. Okay. Bradley starts doing some jumping jacks like this. There is a given work rate for this. If she did that for five minutes, after maybe 30 seconds to a minute, her, inner, her oxygen uptake goes up and it levels off. Okay. Then when she starts going faster, it kind of goes up again for about a minute and it levels off and it stays there. So that is termed an oxygen consumption steady state or a metabolic steady state. Okay. Steady state oxygen consumption happens generally at all exercise intensities below lactate threshold, below the place where more of our pyruvate begins to get shoved over into lactic acid. Okay. After that, we get something called a slow component rise, which is it's going to go up and then it's going to try to level off and then it's just going to start creeping up ever so slowly. Okay. So at very high exercise rates, we rarely will see a steady state of aerobic metabolism. And that's one of the hallmarks of high intensity exercise. Okay. Do I not have, yeah, here's the, the graph that I should have put. So here is oxygen uptake. We oftentimes will measure oxygen uptake either in liters of oxygen per minute, or more commonly, it's in milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight. But the graph's going to look like this no matter what our units. Okay, this is fifty watt cycle. You're just getting warmed up. It goes up, and after about a minute, it levels off. At 100 watts, it takes us about two minutes to get to steady state, but then it levels off. At 150 depending upon how fit you are in a fit person, it goes up and then it levels off. In a person that's not so fit, 150 is over lactate threshold, comes up, and you can see how it slowly begins to trickle upwards from what we would actually expect, okay? Key point to remember here, over this five minutes of exercise, the work rate that I'm doing during that bout of exercise is exactly the same from the very first second until the very last. Okay. From this first moment of starting to pedal the bike to the last moment, I need, let's just say, 100 molecules of ATP to turn the bike at 50 watts. See how aerobic lags start, oxygen consumption lags at the start. Talk about what that is, but there's going to have to be some gap or deficit of ATP production that we're going to have to fill with other metabolic time. When we get out here, an arrow, it can do all of it to the other ones. Okay? But that's what's happening. Okay. We hit on a lot of this yesterday, right? Short duration things, a lot of creatine phosphate use, glycolysis, they're all being used, but we're using predominantly aerobic um, when we get out kind of over say five or six minutes, at about two minutes, we're about 50-50, at one minute, we're about 70-30 in a row. Okay? So that's going to be the thing. That's going to be the thing we got it. We talked about that some yesterday as well. Okay. This graph right here is attempting to show what would basically be a steady increase in work rate on a bike or a steady increase in running speed or a steady increase in the incline on a treadmill and the energy, the aerobic energy expenditure response up to some maximum amount, okay? So what you can see, this is on a bike, so this is watts. You guys remember in health and fitness, we did the, the YMCA bike test, you pedaled the bike, and we made it more difficult and you pedaled it again for a couple of minutes and we made it more difficult and we did it that way. This is the same idea, but rather than stepping it, it's basically like every second it goes up just a little tiny bit. 
And then after multiple minutes, you're going to be way out here. But this kind of nice, steady increase in aerobic energy production that goes on. Okay. The black line here is trying to show lactic acid production. So when is glycolysis going to start? When are we going to start dumping more and more of that pyruvate in glycolysis over to lactic acid? Because there's probably too much of it to get handled in the Krebs cycle. We're going to get out here a little ways, and then it's going to begin to start to rise, and then we're going to get this steady increase. So what this tells us here, when they're both going up, is I'm using glycolysis, fair amount, sometimes a lot, but I'm also using quite a bit of aerobic detail. So they're, we're using both of them simultaneously to meet the ATP demands of these relatively higher birth rates. Okay. Now, what happens eventually out here is your aerobic metabolism can only produce so much ATP. There is a top end maximum limit to it. This fiber type is based on cardiac output, it's based on capillaries based upon how many mitochondria you have, okay? But there is a top end of how much energy aerobic metabolism can supply, and you will get to a place where I can get to here, and I can actually run faster, or I can do more work on the bike, but when I do that, there's no, there's no further increase in oxygen. That means we've reached what we call your DO2 max. The maximum amount or rate of oxygen consumption in aerobic. All of the measures that we make in physiology, this one is the single best predictor when you're going to die. The higher your DO2 max, the longer you live. Okay? It is also the single best predictor of aerobic metabolic function or aerobic metabolic fitness. So that's going to be what's going on here. Okay. Talked about slow components. We talked about these things. Okay. I asked you guys to draw what happens when we stop exercise. You get this thing. I'll be So. Here we go. Riley starts doing jumping jacks. Energy expenditure immediately goes up to this place. She keeps going for, let's say, five minutes at that exact rate of doing jumping jacks. Then she stops. Energy demand in her muscles goes right back down to baseline level. The red graph here is what happens with oxygen consumption. Okay, It lags, just like we saw in the previous ones. And then when she stops, it lags in its ability to go back down to baseline. This purple area is called oxygen deficit, okay? Oxygen deficit is energy provided at the onset of exercise that does not come from aerobic. Okay? This is, in essence, without putting you into an MRI machine, one of the only ways that we can guess at how much anaerobic energy you're using Okay. So that purple area gets filled in by the breakdown of creatine phosphate. It's filled in by pyruvate and lactate. Okay. That's what happens there. Blue area or the EPOC we've already talked about stands for excess post exercise oxygen. This is aerobically produced energy above resting levels that we're going to use to do some stuff after exercise. Okay, we talked about onset, we talked about that. So what's happening during EPOC? Well, we're replenishing ATP and creatine phosphate storage. Okay. We're removing and clearing out lactate production and trying to bring pH back to normal levels. That costs us. We're removing excess CO2. We do that mostly by having an increased breathing. Diaphragm has to keep contracting more. 
that costs us more energy. We are, in essence, cleaning up all of the metabolic byproducts and replenishing energy stores to their resting level. That's why it stays elevated. Now, in most people, after four or five or 10 minutes, you're very close to back down to basic. But you're probably not all the way back down. And as I said, the higher the intensity of exercise, the longer the duration of exercise, the longer or the bigger your epoch is going to be. And the farther from baseline it's going to drop to, it comes back down. This is the thing, as I said, one of the things that Orange Theory Fitness with those studios base their workouts on. If you do enough work at a high enough rate, you will earn enough splat points or whatever, which means then over the course of the next 24 to 48 hours, your metabolic rate will stay elevated above rest by a certain amount, and that burns you an extra 200 calories. But that's the idea. Very, very, very sound physiological science behind that. They need to calculate your heart target heart rates during your exercise bouts, and there's zones on heart rate reserve and not on age predicted max heart rate, but it's a quibble that I have with them. Their chief data scientist is a who used to be, she left last year, is a former UGA where I went to grad school, PhD person. So we had actually talked about right before she left, she was going to give us some data. They have everybody that goes to Orange Theory, you have your things and you sign in, they have all of your data. From every workout you've ever done, they have all of this data. So imagine there's like thousands of studios and thousands of classes, like there's all this data. Um, they were going to give us some data um, to try to do these projects and stuff with, figure out like if they do things better. But then she left and now she works for the, the what's the stupid infrared sauna thing? We just talked about. Pardon? It's, she works for, she's the science person for some uh, thing, one of those now. Yeah. I don't know if it's hot works, but it's something like that. So. Okay. Dr. Deepak, you guys can envision, right? Short answer question. Talk about all of the things that are happening that contribute to EPOC, right? List these things out. Tell me where they came from. Tell me why it's important. Okay. Good. Tell me why a person that uses no creatine phosphate would have a smaller EPOC. Okay. So this is just trying to illustrate, I know we mentioned it, maybe not yesterday, but the day before. The, the blue graph here is showing the resynthesis of creatine phosphate during EPOC, basically. And these curves are not exactly the inverse of each other. Usually PCR will get back to baseline and EPOC will stay up a little bit. Metabolic rate will stay elevated a little bit. But that is one of the primary things that's happening is we're using aerobic metabolism to replenish creatine phosphate. To replenish creatine phosphate. Okay. There's a bunch of graphs that are just kind of showing like steady state during exercise and what EPOC looks like during recovery, right? This is light intensity. Look at what the yellow looks like. Here's moderate intensity. So here we're walking. There we're jogging, right? It gets a lot bigger. Here we're like sprinting. Right, it's even bigger still when it doesn't come all the way back down to baseline and those kinds of things. And it tries to show kind of relatively what deficit and epoch and those things are going to look like. Don't worry about what the slope of these lines are. One of the things that researchers that we do when we try to graph epoch, I don't know how much math you guys have had, but you can basically try to fit an exponential curve to it. And you actually will kind of fit it with a double exponential so that you get a slope right up here at the very start. And the steeper this slope is, tells us something. Then we try to fit a slope to kind of as it is going to get down out here, steepness of that slope and the ratios between those two things tell us different things. It's just mathematical modeling about who can recover faster and who's going to get all the way back to baseline faster. So that's what all those lines are in there for. 
again, well, well, well beyond the scope of what I'm going to ask you guys about, but I wanted to put all the visuals in so that maybe you could kind of see what that looks like in practice. Okay. I'm going to talk about a little different topic. This is a parameter called RER or respiratory exchange ratio. To get your respiratory exchange ratio, and they make things for you guys to do this at home now. Okay. Steam the magic up. Basically, you take a little mouthpiece and blow into it, and it tells you how much fat you're burning. Okay. You're at rest, so it's always going to be. But what RER is, is it's the ratio of CO2 that is expired, so the production or creation of CO2 and aerobic metabolism, divided by the volume of oxygen used in aerobic metabolism. So it's expired CO2 divided by oxygen use. Okay? What this tells us is, in the aerobic metabolic pathway, how much fat how much carbohydrate are we using relative to the amount of energy Okay, So let me give you an example. Fat requires more oxygen to be broken down than carbohydrate. Has to go through the Krebs cycle more, so it makes more CO2. More CO2. Okay? Goes through the electron transport chain more. So we get values of RER, and I do want you guys to know this. This is important. Values of RER are going to range between 0.7, and they should be 1.0, but in some circumstances, we actually see things that go over one. Okay? And I will tell you what this is going to be. When the ratio is, let's just say, 0 0.7, it's on its lowest end, okay? More oxygen use than CO2 production, that tells us we're using a lot of fat, okay? RER of 0.7 means you're only metabolizing fat. We see this in the lab, and it usually means that we haven't calibrated the metabolic heart correctly. Okay. Any of you that have ever, if you've ever done this, or you know anyone that has, even if you don't eat any carbohydrates, you will make carbohydrates through gluconeogenesis in the liver. You're always going to have some explosion. So it should never, ever be 0.7. If all you were burning is carbohydrate, RER value should be 1.0, okay? The amount of CO2 produced to the amount of oxygen consumed is exactly equal when we burn carbohydrate. Exactly equal. So if we think about this from a... I'm sitting and I'm resting to I'm walking to I'm jogging to I'm doing all out high intensity exercise. Remember we talked yesterday that the percentage of my energy expenditure aerobically that comes from carbs versus fat is going to shift. This is just the calculations if you guys want to see the actual numbers, okay? This is RER from a palmitic acid. This is all fat. It's 0.7. Here's RER from glucose. You can see what we're getting. It's 1.0. The real practical application, though, is going to be this. R of 0.7, 100% fat, 0% carbohydrate. Okay? RER of 0.8, 67% fat, one-third carbohydrate. 0.85 is it's exactly 50-50. On an average sort of American diet, at rest, you guys are going to have an RER probably around 0.82. At rest, most people, if they're eating some carbs and some fat, are going to be a little heavy on the fat oxidation compared to carbohydrate. Not a lot, but maybe 60-40. Okay? As exercise intensity increases. If resting is more fat than carbs, walking is going to be closer to 50-50. Jogging is going to start to be like 60-40 or 70-30 carbs to fat, okay? Especially early on. Higher intensity exercise that has an aerobic component, right? 
interval training, relatively fast running or biking or something like that. We may have RERs over 0.9. We're clearly going to be 70, 30, 80, 20 carbs metabolized compared to fat. Okay. We know all. On the previous slide, I said we can get a value over 1.0. Over 1.0. Okay. Over 1.0. We get values over 1.0 because in some circumstances, you actually make extra carbon dioxide in your blood. It's not coming from metabolism. It's not coming from the Krebs cycle. It's coming out of your blood. And so there's extra CO2 to move on. So it can get to be over 1. That is a sure sign. Than anaerobic metabolism, which are made in much lack. RER is ever over 1.0. You are well over lactate plus. This CO2 comes out of a thing which we'll talk about next week called bicarbonate. You store carbon dioxide in your blood as bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is homes, right? It's a buffer. You make lactic acid, you get hydrogen ions, the bicarbonate perhaps is hydrogen ions. To neutralize them, it makes water and CO2. That's how we can get to that. So I got a lot of graphs trying to show like the same sort of concept here. And it's the relative contribution of carbohydrate and fat, energy expenditure during exercise. Okay. Here we have fat oxidation in total cacaos, exercise intensity. So this is going to be sort of the combination of overall energy expenditure and relative RER, relative carbs to fat. So at rest, we're very low, like walking, right? My RER is going to fully favor fat, but I'm not going to burn that many. So I'm about here. During this kind of 50% of VO2. So for some of you, it's walking fast. Okay. That'll probably be me. We have fun times in the black household trying to walk together. My wife's 5'3", our waist is at the same place. She loves to walk fast. I hate it. Short legs are not made for it. We can look like this. And then at 80% and 100%, fat's going to begin to come all the way down. Okay. When you do high-intensity workouts, you're not burning. You're not getting a lot of your energy to do that. Too slow. Too slow to break it down. Okay. Here is the percentage of VO2 max, 25, 65, 85% of VO2 max that we're exercising. So light, moderate, intense exercise, and the percentage of your total fuel that is coming from glycogen and glucose. So those two carb sources, plasma-free fatty acids, and potentially the intramuscular fat was muscle triglyceride. And so what you can see is at 25%, very little glycogen is used, right? Very little plasma glucose is used. The vast majority of our energy is coming from fat in the blood and fat from within the muscle. When you get out of walking up into kind of a brisk jog, we're about 50-50 fat, carbohydrates, a lot of that carbs coming from glycogen. And then at very high exercise intensities, much less fat use, much more carb use as a percentage, the vast majority of that carb use coming from glycogen. Okay. Showing just kind of the relative contributions from, from where things are coming from. Okay. I think this is the last slide on the list. Now let's imagine what happens to your RER over time. You're exercising at a constant work rate. Let's say you're going to exercise for four hours. Okay, on the bike, in the heat, with the rectal thermo thermo thermostat. I have not done that one, but it was done while I was there. Okay. Look at the changes in relative contributions from carbs and fat in their particular energy stores as we go over the course of four hours. So let's just say I'm jogging a marathon. It takes me four hours. Okay. I'm going to run at exactly the same pace the entire time. We start off, we're about 50-50 carbs to fat, okay? About 50-50. Carbs down here, fat up here. Over time, 
contribution of glycogen drops off, the contribution of blood glucose increases, but my overall contribution from carbs at that same work rate is going to begin to decline a little bit. And overall contribution from plasma free fatty acids is going to increase, and my overall contribution to the total from fat is going to come up so slightly. So at the start, I was 50 50. At the end, I'm like 60 40. In general, at kind of moderate intensity aerobic training, the longer you go, RER will fall. More fat you'll use as a percentage of total expenditure, the longer it will. This is the idea behind what my dad used to say it takes 45 minutes for you to burn any fat. It was a misinterpretation of this shift and this change that as time goes on, RER fall. Okay. How are we doing? Time. Let me see what I've got. Um, let's talk about fatigue now, and we'll do VO two max stuff tomorrow. Okay. So I'm going to jump to the end. We'll come back and pick up the VO two stuff tomorrow before we do. Okay. This is what we talked about. So, when we talk about fatigue, we don't just mean that you're tired, that's sleep, very different thing. Okay? From a neuromuscular or an exercise perspective, fatigue, fatigue means this sort of decrease in physical and mental performance. Okay? There's a couple of questions I want you to know the answers to. This. One of them is how is fatigue different from weakness? Okay. So to understand this, we have to define these terms very carefully. Weakness refers to an inability to produce an adequate amount of initial or starting force. Okay. We'll do a there. Brock, how much can you bench? 275. Great. If I gave Brock 300 pounds, He's too weak, quote unquote, to be able to bench to 300 pounds. That is more than he can generate an initial portion. Okay? That's the idea of weakness. Okay? It's not some descriptor of what you can and can't do. It's just, I am not able to generate that much force. That is called weakness from the mechanics. Fatigue would be, I give him 250 pounds. He lifts it once, he lifts it twice, he can't lift it a third time, okay? That's fatigue. He could do it, and now he can't. That's what we saw with Riley. She could hold the bag there. She could generate an adequate amount of starting force to do that, that exercise, but then she ceased to be able to at some point over there. Okay. Another thing to keep in mind, it sometimes looks the same. We're going to call it injury here. We're also going to sometimes call it muscle damage. If it was a regular semester, we had a couple more days, we'd actually do a whole like day on muscle damage because it's one of my favorite things. How many of you have been sore? You've ever been sore? Okay. Have you never been sore? Mm -hmm. We can fix that today if you want. Okay. Any of you that have ever been sore, your muscles have been sore. You have injured or damaged your muscle, likely through performing high force, novel things you're not used to doing, eccentric muscle contraction. Okay. One of the things that happens in the days after while you're sore is your maximal strength and ability to generate force falls. It goes down. Okay. Because you've obliterated some active in mice. You cannot form as many cross bridges as you can't use before. Okay. So you may look like you're fatigued. You may look like that you're weak, but it's not because you could do something and then now you can't. It's because we have physically removed some sarcomeres from being able to do something. So sometimes functionally that ends up being the same thing, but it is 
it's kind of an important distinction. So when we talk about fatigue, what we really mean is day you could do it and you started and then you had to stop or slow down. Okay. So I hit those two things. We generally break fatigue down into two big things. Hit, hit, compare, contrast. These might be short answer questions that are going to appear at some point, right? Peripheral fatigue is failure. And people keep arguing about this and nobody ever gets it right. So I'm not going to make you guys know. But generally, we say peripheral fatigue is everything distal of the motor neuron. Okay. Some people will argue it's also the motor neuron. I don't know. Some people argue it has to be on the muscle side of the neuromuscular junction. It's really semantics. Okay. Basically, peripheral fatigue is stuff from the axon to somewhere in the muscle. Some part of that signaling pathway has stopped working. And therefore, it will not signal to allow an adequate amount of cross bridges to be formed to get an adequate amount of force. Okay. The sites of this could range from actual potential propagation somewhere in the cross bridge site. It might be a depletion of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. Not likely, but it might be, right? It might be an inability to release calcium, an inability to excite the sarcolemma, or a T-tubule, or an inability of the calcium to bind to troponin, or an inability of the myosin to be able to actually bind onto the act. There's a whole host of things that it could be, okay, that it could be. Central fatigue is often referred to as a psychological factor, okay? Central, brain, spinal cord, okay? What we call descending motor pathway. So something happens in the motor cortex, the alpha motor neuron will not output as many action potentials as they were before. Or maybe the motor cortex is putting out the same number of action potentials, but something has happened and now the alpha motor neurons are working. That's central fatigue. Central fatigue, is most common during low to moderate force contractions that last a long time, okay? Low to moderate force that lasts for some period of time. There is an argument to be made that most of the fatigue in your daily life is central. You could do a little bit more if you were, we just motivated you to do so, okay? You could do more if we asked you to by threatening your puppy dog. Your friend, whatever. So let me give you a little bit of information about some of the kind of individual sites and things that we know about. So action potential propagation, either in the axon or in the sarcolemma, can be relatively common. Okay. Failure of action potential propagation usually, usually is a sign that. Sodium potassium pumps are not able to repolarize those membranes fast enough. Okay. We haven't talked about it very much, but the sodium potassium pump uses a lot of ACP. So when you're doing very high intensity exercise, there's only a finite amount of ATP. You really want to try to use it in the cross bridges so that you can continue to generate force. And so you may not have enough to do the cross bridge cycle and to repolarize all the Okay. It may be a failure of neuromuscular transmission. So you're not going to release an adequate amount of acetylcholine across the neuromuscular junction. This often means that you're having a hard time. You release the acetylcholine, it binds to its receptor, acetylcholinesterase breaks it off. And then the acetylcholine gets recycled and sucked back up into the nerve side of the junction, repackaged in its vesicles so it can get released. We can induce this in the lab. When I brought the stimulation, the simulator in that day, and I was making my muscle contract, boom, 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 boom. If we do that at very high action potential rates for, say, five or 10 minutes, I can probably deplete acetylcholine in the neuromuscular. Would happen in you guys, but it's probably very, very likely. When we get peripheral fatigue, like when you're doing a set of squats or something, 
you're much more likely to have a failure of action potential propagation or excitation contraction coming than this. We're usually really good at recycling the seal coal. And then probably the most common one is excitation contraction coupling failure. There can be a failure of signaling in the T-tubule and or there can be a failure of our ability to get calcium out of the circuit. And that may be related to less signal from the T-tubule, but it may also be related to failure of the ranadine receptor and calcium tends to bind inorganic phosphate a lot. So when ATP turnover is very, very high during high intensity exercise, the calcium release from the sarcoplasmic in particular binds the inorganic phosphate. It makes a salt and it gets stuck in the sarcoplasmic in particular. And you can't release more calcium. So then you stop that and you've got to report production. And then you rest and it all gets broken back apart and recycled within a few minutes. Anyway, that's a change again. So something here, either T-tubule depolarization or calcium release tend to be the most common form of peripheral. I am very confident that Riley was experiencing some of this while she was holding her back. Every time you do anything where it requires more and more effort to do it, you're getting a little bit of this. Okay. Calcium ions, we talked about that. That may not get pumped back fast enough to maintain force production. That's going to be a big problem. The other big thing with peripheral fatigue is hydrogen. Okay. As the muscle becomes more acidic because more pyruvate is made into lactic acid, hydrogen just messes everything. Okay. It slows down our allosteric enzymes, which slows down glycolysis. It slows down the Krebs cycle. Okay. It inhibits things in the muscle. It impairs excitation contraction coupling directly. Hydrogen impairs the ryanidine receptor, so you cannot release calcium from the sarcoplasm in particular. It impairs the binding of calcium to troponin. Okay? It also messes up circa and impairs calcium getting pumped back into the sarcoplasm in particular. It also inhibits the myosin ATPase and inhibits cross bridge formation. <laughs> oh, yeah, and it slows down glycolysis. Okay. And it makes your legs hard or your arms hard. Hydrogen is bad. Okay. It's bad. It, it causes problems in many, 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 many places. Okay. In many places. Okay. I'm going to give you two examples of a thing that we call substrate depletion. They're going to be examples of two different kinds of okay. creatine phosphate depletion. You run out of ATP. This is peripheral fatigue. Okay. This is peripheral fatigue. You have no more. You cannot make enough total ATP to do what you want. You got to slow down. That's peripheral fatigue. I mentioned this earlier, we'll see a little bit more tomorrow about how we avoid it, but there's also a phenomenon called glycogen depletion. With glycogen depletion, all of the muscle glycogen is gone. Okay? It's all been used up. So we've now lost one of our sources of glucose to supply glucose into glycolysis in the muscle. Now, when that happens, we normally still have an adequate amount of blood glucose. Right? We have glycogen in our liver that matches blood glucose uptake. We'll see that tomorrow. We usually still have plenty of blood glucose. Plus, we have a huge amount of fat stores. We can still make plenty of ATP via aerobic metabolism. But something weird happens. When glycogen becomes depleted, we get brain inhibition of the motor cortex. Okay. Think the sensors are in the hypothalamus to check blood glucose. When they sense the blood glucose levels, glycogen is gone, blood glucose is beginning to fluctuate more than we want, it sends inhibitory signals to the motor cortex that says slow down or worse, stop. Stop. Glycogen depletion, even though the glycogen is in the periphery, glycogen depletion is central fatigue, okay. central fatigue. Okay, 
Let's stop there. Okay. Tomorrow we'll do our hormone stuff and we'll talk about the internet. Thanks, guys. Please make sure I have your test. If I don't have them, you're not getting a grade.